people are kind of caught in the middle sometimes, or they feel very confused about how to proceed when they are introduced or they are starting to resonate with a more natural lifestyle and they don't feel confident speaking with their medical professionals. <music> Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces. I also bring you ideas and techniques that you can grab and use to set goals, create, and unlock your potential for changing yourself and the world. And now let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you so much for being here. This is super exciting for me. I have Vanessa Nixon on the show. Check this out. Vanessa Nixon is a traditional naturopath and the CEO of the natural cosmetics company, Natural Look Mineral Makeup. She's also a professional belly dance instructor. Woohoo! She loves helping empower women to thrive during the spiritual initiation of their menopausal journey through natural health, natural movement, and natural beauty. After starting her life over at 50 years old, she found a profound way to step powerfully into her new life with vibrant health, and she's touched the lives of many women in similar situations. This is so exciting for me. Vanessa, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Isolda, for having me on the show. I'm really delighted to be here speaking with you today. This is so, thank you. I appreciate that. This is so cool because, uh, you you know, professional belly dance instructor, I once tried to learn belly dance and, and had to stop because the, the Maya, the thing that makes you do that figure eight thing, made me queasy. So I <laughs> had to stop. But uh, it's so exciting to me to see women embracing something like this. And, and I love that you work with women almost exclusively, it looks like, to help women of a certain age thrive. And I would love if you could talk just a little bit about how you you said you you started your life over at 50. How did you get to that point where you decided at 50, you know what, I need to start over? I would love to get your story on that. Well, thank you for asking. Uh, that is an interesting story. And it wasn't so much that I decided I needed to start over. Um, then it was that I was kind of forced into the situation where mm. I needed to make some tough decisions. And what I find is that um, a lot of women have very similar circumstances during midlife and especially during men menopause. And mm. so for me, what brought that on was that in a uh, about a two year period, I turned 50. I went through menopause. I went through a divorce after 20 years of marriage. Wow. Uh, uh, two of my children, two of my three daughters moved out on their own. And the third was, you know, uh, planning her exit. So I was looking at being an empty nester, moved to a new city, bought my own house for, my, for the first time on my own and restarted my career after having spent 20 years raising children. So there were just a lot of things going on in my life, a lot of changes, a lot of shifts. And I, what I realized was that I could either look at these things as, you know, really negative, unfortunate, uh, traumatic, tragic events in my life, or I could look at all of these things as opportunities. And, um, uh, and be able to be proactive in taking these opportunities and making this next chapter of my life what I really wanted it to be um, according to my gifts, my talents, and the things that I want to bring into the world. And so that's what I've done. And because I'm a traditional naturopath, because I have my own healing journey that I went on to heal myself of chronic illness earlier in my life. Um, you know, I came into all of these changes uh, that I just spoke of having really good health. But what I have seen around me is that most women 
coming into midlife, coming into the transition of perimenopause to menopause to postmenopause, haven't had 30 years to really work on their health and make sure that they are in optimal health going into this transition. And so all of these other things that tend to shift and change at the same time that they're going through midlife um, really take a toll because um, they start having a lot of health symptoms. Their bodies re really start speaking to them. And what I realized in, in my case was not only did I have um, really super optimal health, um, but I also had a support network. I had been cultivating a network of women around me. And it was uh, one of the things that really helped me through all of these transitions um, so well was having that support of other women and I, I find that it's that's something that's missing in our culture today is, you know, women don't talk about menopause. It's still kind of a taboo subject. And we really need that support. We really need to start talking about it because it is a natural, normal part of life. And I really believe that it, it holds so many opportunities for us. Um, women, especially at this time of their lives, have a really unique opportunity, a really potent and powerful opportunity to change their lives, to create something new in their lives that can really impact the world. And I want to be able to support other women going through those situations. What? Wow, wow, wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll notice, you'll notice me doing that. Uh, some people call it dead air. I call it anticipatory air. I will take a minute sometimes when something is particularly powerful. I'll take a minute to synthesize what was just said. Wow. Wow. Okay, Vanessa. So there's so much to to dig into here. And I, I absolutely want to talk about supporting a network of women. And I absolutely want to talk about the opportunities that menopause provides for women and, and see if we can detail that a little bit. But before we do that, you said you are a traditional naturopath. And I don't actually know that I know what that is. What mm -hmm. is a what 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 does a naturopath do? And how does a naturopath provide service or value to people like I, I'm honestly like I'm listening to you and I'm going I've done research but I, there's a difference obviously between a non-traditional naturopath and a traditional naturopath or you wouldn't say it so what is a traditional naturopath that is a great question uh, so naturopaths um, in general all types of naturopaths um, support uh, the health the health of the body through natural modalities such as nutrition, herbal medicine, homeopathy, reflexology, aromatherapy. There are many different natural modalities and uh, naturopaths can choose to specialize in particular modalities. I um, specifically like to focus on nutritional healing, herbal medicine, and then some of the more vibrational modalities like flower essences, homeopathy, and energy exercises. Um, the reason that I use the term traditional naturopath is because there are two, um, you could say different tracks when you are choosing to become a naturopath. And one is the more medicalized approach of um, becoming a naturopathic physician. Mm. Um, and then the other is the traditional naturopath approach, which is taking the route that uh, naturopaths have traditionally taken, you know, over centuries, and that is to just specifically study natural modalities and not get into the disease and pathology that you would get in a more medicalized education. So um, that also means that if you're a naturopathic physician, you can bill insurance, you can do minor surgery, you can prescribe uh, drugs. Um, whereas as a traditional naturopath, I am not able to do any of those things. Um, so 
I am, I guess most people would think of me more as a consultant, a natural health consultant. Mm -hmm. um, I am, I am not a, tr a doctor in the, tr in the, nat uh, the conventional sense of the word. Mm -hmm. um, so my training has been all about how to create and maintain health through natural means. Does that make sense? Absolutely, it does. And it makes me wonder, uh, are, are people who are acupuncturists and acupressure people, people who do that sort of thing, is that part of being a naturopath? Or is that something that's a different discipline altogether? Um, that is a separate discipline, although okay. there are acupuncturists and acupressurists who are naturopaths as well, but it is a separate training. I see. And it's interesting to me in listening to in listening to you, I'm kind of going, it's funny how innovative it seems to be doing something that is considered traditional, right? So we, oh. we tend to go to my sister is a doctor, she's a dermatologist, she's amazing, she's an amazing diagnostician, blah, 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 all of this stuff. I talk about her on the show all the time. And she she sort of has embraced more of the natural ways of doing certain things than she used to, in part because she's my sister and I talk about natural ways of doing things all the time and she's <laughs> done research as a result. And yet most what we'll call, let's call it, we'll call it Western medicine, I'll call it that just because to make that distinction is not looking necessarily towards natural uh, remedies, if you will, even though a lot of the medicines were derived originally from natural means. Like I always think of white willow bark uh, into aspirin, mm -hmm. things like that. So, so you're doing something that it, even though it's what you're calling traditional is really quite innovative when juxtaposed against what is sort of considered the norm today. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how that evolved, if you have an, a, an opinion and an, or an idea, and also what do we do to keep innovating in something that is so traditional? Mm, those are great questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, I I love how you have framed that um, as being innovative by kind of going back, back to what is more traditional, and that is something that I really have resonated with uh, throughout my adult life because I actually was raised um, in a very conventional family. My mother was a nurse, and so we were pretty. Uh, you know, deeply entrenched in the uh, Western conventional medical model. And what I find is that that's, that's very, very common for people in our culture to really know nothing about traditional um, medicine, mm -hmm. you know, because we have been born and raised in our, uh, for several generations back now, people have been born and raised and accustomed to Western medicine. And I, I had never even heard of herbal medicine, you know, as a child or a teenager mm -hmm. or even a young adult. And so that was part of my healing journey was finding out about uh, natural ways to heal and, and healing myself of chronic illness. And so when I first heard of herbal medicine, it was completely new to me. It seemed very innovative. It's like, wow, there, there are options. There are, there are things other than what I've been raised with mm -hmm. and maybe they might even work better for me. And, and that was what happened in my case. But um, I do see that, you know, over especially the last century, there have been a few times where there has been a revival of people looking to the past, looking to the wisdom of, you know, past cultures, uh, more, you know, tribal cultures, times when we actually were raised with the wisdom of what foods to eat to keep us healthy and what herbs and plants to incorporate into our lives to heal us of certain things. And, um, and now we have 
uh, you know, not only those oral traditions that were passed down in certain cultures around the world, uh, but we have the scientific evidence in many, you know, hundreds of cases of different herbs uh, to, to prove that, uh, you know, there is, a, a, you know, scientific basis and efficacy for the use of many of these different natural modalities that you know have been used in, in some instances for 5,000 years. Um, so I really love that blend that we have now of having the traditional wisdom about how to keep ourselves healthy and whole. And then we also now have the scientific backing for that. And so that is part of what I see is so innovative uh, in today's world is that we have both sides. And in the past, we, we haven't always had that. And I think that's one of the reasons why many of us grew up not knowing about any of these natural modalities is because we didn't necessarily have the scientific evidence behind it. But you know, now we do have volumes and volumes of data showing how effective and safe um, these more natural uh, therapeutic modalities can be. I'm nodding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. In, in, again, I'm listening to you and I'm kind of going, yeah, it's really great that we have these studies. And I remember talking to friends about studies that took place in the 1990s about the efficacy of various herbal remedies. And a lot of these NIH studies were going, there's nothing, there's no, there's no veracity to this. And when you looked at who participated in the study, out of the 83 medical professionals who were in the study, 79 were taking money from big pharma. So oh, okay. it was this really interesting moment where I said, I always want to know the source mm -hmm. of any study, you know, no matter, no matter what the study is, I always want to know who, bottom line, who's paying for it so that we can be informed patients and informed consumers. You know, that, that to me is really crucial. And something else to think about, I, I would love to talk to you about something that you just said and ask your thoughts on it because you said that they're working together and I think that's amazing. I love the notion of of more natural, you know, naturopathic paths and western medicine working together. But here's the thing. There's a little bit of a sort of a, a an authority figure syndrome that happens where a person who needs that kind of help may not feel confident talking to their medical professional about it, about wanting to do things more naturally, for example. What are your thoughts and do you have any guidance for someone who's starting on that path and maybe isn't going the whole naturopath way yet, but needs to be more proactive and needs to be more confident talking to their medical professional about some of these other possibilities. Mm, yes, uh, I, I do often see that as well. That, you know, people are kind of caught in the middle sometimes or they feel very confused about how to proceed when they are introduced or they are starting to resonate with a more natural lifestyle and they mm -hmm. don't feel confident mm -hmm. speaking with their uh, medical professionals. And uh, so that is very common. And what I'm seeing that makes me feel hopeful is a lot more integrative medicine. And that is where you might have a wellness center that has MDs and also NDs. Uh, so, you know, um, conventional medical doctors, Western doctors, as well as um, maybe naturopathic physicians, perhaps, you know, a traditional nat naturopath like myself, maybe an herbalist, maybe an acupuncturist, maybe a massage therapist, you know, people of all different disciplines of health and wellness in the same uh, organization who can refer clients and patients to each other and have a whole team that can help you address your health concerns. And I'm seeing that more and more. And so I'm really hopeful that we can start moving toward that model because 
even as a traditional naturopath, um, I, you know, who, who raised my three children completely um, without Western medicine, I still really believe that conventional Western medicine is important mm -hmm. and has a place, uh, you know, a very crucial place in healthcare. And so my, my feeling is that integration is going to be a really strong way forward for not only the uh, health professions, but for for our people who who need us. And uh, so I really encourage people to take that viewpoint of of having a team mm -hmm. and not just having one healthcare, you know, primary healthcare provider, which is kind of the model that we have have been thrust into is thinking, you know, you, you have one primary. And I really think that it, it you know, it takes a village, it, it takes, it takes a whole team of supporters. And that's why I spoke earlier about cultivating a network of uh, supportive women around me. And I think that as women, especially that's, that's part of what we need to be healthy. Uh, we are as women, we are human beings who need connection and we need community and we need each other. We need that sense of interdependence. And so I really do encourage people to think about your healthcare that way. And when you go to talk to your more conventional Western healthcare practitioners to frame it that way that, you know, I value your input, but I also want more support and you know, these are the people that I would like to add to the team. And I'm hoping for your support in being able to communicate effectively together so that we can all work together uh, for, you know, my health and wellness and that of my family. And I think framing it that way can be a really great way to to get people to to be on the team, you know, to have that team mentality that, yeah, let's let's all work together to reach this goal. I love that. And it, it, it what it sparks in me is the need for a certain amount of confidence. Now, I get that we all deserve to be confident in the fact that we are, you know, I, I say this to my coaching clients all the time, you are the boss of you here, you, you are the boss of what happens to you. So being confident enough to talk to your doctor to talk to to, to say, hey, I want there to be a team that works on this with me and with you so that we are all involved in my health and wellness what do you say to people who are afraid to do that? Mm. I think what I would say is something that I often talk to my own clients about and is something that we work on. And it's kind of a, a premise that forms the basis of how I feel about health and wellness, especially for women. And that is that we as women, especially have a very strong intuition. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for us, especially at this time in our lives, you know, when we are at that, that midpoint where we are transitioning through perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, and becoming the elders of our, our clans, our families, that we really are intentional about tapping into our own inner wisdom and our own intuition, because we, we can be our own healers. I, I truly believe that um, especially as I, I spoke ab about this uh, a few minutes ago, um, about knowing in the, in the past and past generations, and maybe when our, our 
societies were, you know, a little bit more, more tribal or village-like, we all had that wisdom, that knowledge of how to keep ourselves healthy. And I believe we still do. We still have that, those ancestral memories, that ancestral wisdom that still lives in us and tapping into our intuition, tapping into our inner healer, our inner wisdom, whatever you want to call that, our higher power, our, you know, whatever word you want to use. I think that is a really crucial component of how to live really healthy lives and keep ourselves and our families healthy. And I think that there's a lot of confidence that comes out of that when you are connected to your intuition, when you know, and you know, you know, <laughs> that this is, this is the way forward for you. There, there is a, a tremendous amount of confidence that comes from that. And I have experienced finding that confidence myself. And I've had experienced, you know, helping guide my clients to find their own confidence in tapping into their intuition. And so for me, that's key. That's key is to be intentional about being open to the messages that your body's sending you, listening to your own guidance, and then following it, knowing that your, your own intuition, your own higher power, your own wisdom only has your best interests in mind. And following that is always going to lead you to, toward your goal. And uh, so for me, that's, that's the place to start is really finding whatever way that is right for you that helps you to just be still and listen to your own guidance. And mic drop. That was delightful. Absolutely. When you're talking about intuition, you're singing my song. I'm, I'm, I'm the queen of advocating for intuition. And I feel like the belly clench does not get enough credit because that belly clench is what allows us to go. I'm getting, my body is giving me information I need to listen. And so often we don't, right? Mm -hmm. We don't listen to ourselves when we really need to be. When that's happening, it's trying to tell you something. It's trying to give you information. And so, so how, how would we do that? How do we, in your thoughts, how do we listen to ourselves when we're used to listening to others? Do you have a first step to give? Uh, yes, actually I do. Awesome. Uh, and thank you for asking that. So <clears throat> what I have found time and again is that it's different for everybody. <laughs> and so <laughs> that step is, is going to look different for all of us, but I can give some examples. Um, meditation is a really great place to start mm -hmm. and meditation itself looks different for, for each person. Uh, when, when I think of meditation and I think when a lot of people think of meditation, we think of, you know, sitting in a yoga posture and doing some deep breathing and chanting and, you know, spending an hour in, you know, some sort of guided visualization. And that certainly is one way to meditate, but mm. it's just one of hundreds of ways. Sure. And, you know, I, I certainly can't sit for an hour and meditate like that myself. <laughs> uh, and I th think that a lot of people resonate with that. Uh, so for me, what I have found is dancing. And that's one of the reasons why I belly dance. One of the reasons why I'm a belly dance instructor is because I, I have always been a dancer, but I found belly dancing in my early twenties and, uh, Along the way, I learned what a powerful form of expression it can be for women because it was created, you know, and danced and performed by women and for women. And the dance itself is, tells the story of womanhood and the moves were created to help a woman's body go through the transitions that she needs to go through through her life. And so the whole dance is about women's empowerment and it's about listening to your body and supporting your body and what it needs. And so for me, my, my 
best form of meditation, the, the, the form of meditation that gets me in that zone where inspiration drops in and I can hear my intuition the most clearly is when I'm dancing and when I just lose myself in the music and the movement. And so, you know, movement is a really a powerful form of meditation. And there's this mm -hmm. whole, um, you know, cultural movement right now around embodiment. And so that's about taking your, your learnings, your insights, your inspirations and bringing them into your body. And that can be through movement. It can be through breath work. Um, but, you know, that connection with your body and integrating things through your body is, is really powerful. So, and as I said, you know, there's so many different forms of meditation. Just taking a walk in nature can be a wonderful way to meditate and to get in touch and tap into your intuition. Um, you know, just going into your backyard and breathing in the fresh air and allowing the sun to hit your body or, you know, uh, working with your plants in your garden or even just on your windowsill if you don't have access to outdoor space, you know, growing a few plants on your windowsill, walking your dog, you know, all of these can be forms of meditation if you're intentional about it. And so maybe that's the place to start is with your intention to, to, to have whatever your chosen form be, for that to be your meditation, for that to be your time to tap in. So starting with the intention and then just allowing that time and space, allowing, you know, allowing the, your body to speak to you allowing the stillness to occur so that you can hear what may come through and just knowing that sometimes it will and sometimes it won't but but holding that intention that yes i'm going to create a ritual uh, you know maybe a daily routine maybe you know once a week or twice a week or twice a day i have that intention to just create this space to allow myself to tap in, to listen, be still, and just go from there. Yeah, it's I love I love what you just said. And it's so interesting to me because it's about making space to listen, right to quiet your busy mind long enough to perhaps hear what else might be coming through. And I think that is powerful it's also to me what in, in listening to you i i can't help feeling like intention is only part of what you need to do intention is great if you intend to do something that's great and yet you still have to do it right you still have to in intending to make space once a week or twice a week or whatever is great but what's even better is if you actually follow through and and do the space making and let yourself calm down or quiet down enough so that you can listen to yourself. There's something really powerful in there that, that the, the difference between intending to and doing it, there's a, there's a point of no return when you actually start doing it, something bigger happens. And I think that that part that you touched on is brilliant. I think that that's exactly, yes, I'm so excited. So I, I do want to, I do want to pivot just a little bit and ask you something you mentioned, uh, you know, letting the natural world be sort of our our nutrients and our and our medicine and all of that and I think that's amazing yet one of the things that I worked at NASA for many years doing environmental education and soil science so I'm putting on my soil science education hat right now and I and I want to say some of these teachings that are thousands of years or hundreds of years old are talking about plants that were grown when the soil was really pretty nutrient rich, but we don't have a lot of nutrient rich soil nowadays. In fact, our soil is pretty nutrient poor. So how has how does that change what a naturopath does with respect to herbalism? If we know that some of these herbs, many of these herbs that used to have these nutrients might be anemic as far as some of those nutrients are concerned. What are your thoughts on that? And how do we address that in your opinion moving forward? 
Mm, yeah, that's that's a really key point. And it is important to address that. And uh, so one of the things that is important for me is uh, growing organically mm -hmm. and or biodynamically and making sure that, you know, the way that you are living is sustainable and is giving back. And I think that that's, that's a piece about particularly herbal medicine that's really key for me is looking at this as a relationship with mm -hmm. the plants mm -hmm. and that it's a reciprocal relationship. And so I really encourage my clients to, once they find their plant allies, you know, the plants that are really specific for them and their situation and their health goals, uh, I really encourage them to get to know these plants and even, you know, start growing them themselves mm. in an organic way and so that they can cultivate the reciprocal nature of herbalism, where the herbs are, are offering their, their benefits and their health giving abilities to you. But in return, you are also offering something to the plants and it, it can just be gratitude, um, but it could also be creating a space and nurturing an environment that's healthy for them so that they can flourish and they can get the nutrients that they need so that they in turn can give you the nutrients you need. And so just kind of reframing medicine uh, to be this reciprocal relationship with the environment around you. I think that's a really great place to start. And so if you're looking at it that way, then you can start to research, okay, what do these plants need to flourish? How can I help my little colony of stinging nettles or dandelions or, you know, chamomile or holy basil, you know, how, what, what can I give my, you know, little cultivated area of healing plants, what they need. And, um, you know, there are a lot of places that you can get organic uh, herbs that you can be using in your herbal medicine, uh, you know, rituals and regimens. And so I think that that's another, um, for me, it's a must, you know, having, having uh, organic foods and, and herbs, you know, things that you are consuming and putting in your body, um, knowing that at least that, you know, that cycle of having, you know, strip the soil of nutrients is, is starting to change that and, and go back to cultivating plants in a way that's healthy for them um, so that then they can, you know, give us what's healthy for us. I think it's a really important um, basis for natural health is thinking about things in, in those, you know, terms of, of relationships instead of just, you know, what do I need to get for health? Uh, so I think that's a great place to start. Yeah, I think that's great. And it, that, that notion of a reciprocal relationship is uh, something that's crucial. And, and, and yet, like I, I, as I'm listening to you, I'm going, well, my whole first part of my life, I was a hardcore carnivore, right? I'm vegan now, but I was a hardcore carnivore. And I looked, I gave the side eye to almost every vegetable. And so, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm postmenopausal. I'm, you know, all of these things. So I've lived a long time. And I guess the question that I have sort of selfishly to ask, even though I kind of know the answer for myself, but is it too late ever? Is it, is, is it ever too late to start? Or can you start today to make some of these changes, even if you're a menopausal woman or postmenopausal woman, even if you're a man who is, who is, you know, fifties or sixties, is there a time when you're like, ah, it's too late for this body it's over, or can you start today and still make an impact? I absolutely 100% believe that it is never too late. Awesome. Yes. Okay. That was an easy <laughs> answer, right? Uh <laughs> it was an easy answer. And I just want to there there's something else that I think wants to come through here that kind of speaks to this and also speaks to your um 
your last question. And that is that, you know, especially with, with herbal medicine, which is, you know, one of my favorites, uh, my favorite modalities, um, you know, we often will recommend herbal teas. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yes, a lot of the herbs in herbal teas have been grown in um, soils that are depleted. And so maybe they don't have as many of the benefits. Maybe they're not as potent as they were hundreds or thousands of years ago. Um, and most people think of making an herbal tea. Uh, you know, you steep your, your herbs in the tea for a few minutes and then you take out your tea bag or you strain out your herbs and then you drink your tea. And you, that's kind of the, the assumption, you know, of, of how to make a tea uh, in our world today. And um, so one of the ways that you can make your medicine at least 10 times more potent, and in some cases, even a hundred times more, more potent is instead of steeping your tea for a few minutes, um, depending on which herb you're using, you can steep it overnight for, you know, eight, 10 hours, and that will draw out 10 times, 50 times, and in some cases, even a hundred times more of the minerals that are in those plants than if you had just steeped it for five minutes. So that is one way that I often recommend for certain herbs, certain herbs that are more food-like herbs. There are certain classes of herbs that you, you can't do that with because of the constituents of the plants, but the more food-like herbs like oat straw and nettles um, and, you know, uh, wild violets and uh, alfalfa and things like that, you can steep overnight uh, and make an overnight infusion and then drink all through the next day. And so that's a way to get a lot more nutrients out of your herbs. And, and so, especially if you're in midlife and you're just starting now and you're wondering if it's too late, that's something to look into and work with um, a knowledgeable herb, herbalist about is how to get more nutrients out of these medicinal herbs that I'm taking um, so that I can you know, really make an impact on my health and reach my health goals at this time in life. So there are lots of different ways to do it, but it's absolutely doable. And there's, um, you know, so much information out there. And I just really encourage people to reach out to natural healthcare providers, maybe, you know, somebody who specializes in a modality that you haven't tried before, but you really resonate with and um, just know that there are so many options and it is never too late. That's lovely to hear. Uh, thank you for that, Vanessa. I love that it came through and that, that you're, you're so articulate in, in explaining and describing these things. You said something um, um, earlier in the conversation, I don't, even, I, don't, I don't know how long ago, but you said something that, I, I, that stuck with me and I went, I, I actually wrote it down because I want to touch on it. You said that menopause, presents a bunch of opportunities for women. Can you talk a little bit about what sorts of opportunities menopause does have mm -hmm. for women? Yes, yes, this is actually one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, <laughs> Yay! <laughs> in fact, I, I often um, frame it as uh, menopause can be a spiritual initiation into your most vibrant, healthy, and impactful years. Mm. And um, so, you know, oftentimes we come into this time of our lives having spent the former part of our lives focused outwardly on other people, you know, taking care of our families, raising our children, maybe taking care of our parents, um, putting a lot of energy into a career um, and not really focusing on ourselves, mm -hmm. not really creating that space to go in deeply and tap into, you know, that intuition that we spoke of earlier and find out what's, what's there, what wants to come out, what, mm -hmm. what wants to uh, be created in our lives. And so for many women, menopause provides 
their first opportunity to really deeply care for themselves. Mm. And often this is presented as a health crisis where they have to, like there's no alternative. They have to start taking the time for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one of the reasons why I, I call this an opportunity, why I call this a spiritual initiation, because if you take that opportunity to really go in deeply, to really create the space to deeply care for yourself on the physical level, the emotional level, the mental level, the spiritual level, your, your menopausal journey can be a journey of rebirth. And I really love the fact that in traditional Chinese medicine, they refer to menopause as the second spring. And I think that that is just a really beautiful way to look at this next phase of your life as this is the springtime of your life. It's your second spring where you are in a new cycle of rebirth. And you've gone through this whole cycle. You know, if we think about the cycle of birth and growth and then maturing and then death and then rebirth. And so we have experienced a death of sorts. You know, it's the death of our reproductive years. And I think it's important to acknowledge that and even to grieve that. And then to move on into this next cycle of rebirth. And so there are so many opportunities that women find when they really do that work of creating that space to really care for themselves in ways that maybe they never have before. Um, you know, maybe now, as I mentioned, you know, with me, my menopausal cycle brought divorce, it brought you know, becoming an empty nester and moving to a new town and, and renewing my career. So all of these, you know, created a space for rebirth in my life. Mm. And I see that in so many women that, yes, there, there may be losses or what you could view as loss or death. Um, but on the other side of that is the opportunity for rebirth. And, and, Yes, we are past the time where we could birth children into the world if we uh, so, so chose to do that in our reproductive years. We're past that now, but we still have that creative energy that, that um, comes from that womb space that we all have as women. Whether we even have a physical womb anymore or not, we have that womb space where that creative energy that went into reproducing human children, now we can use that same creative energy to birth other things into the world, using our gifts, our talents, and all of the wisdom that we've accumulated throughout our lives. We can birth new careers. We can birth new communities. We can birth new projects and new hobbies and new wonderful spaces into the world. And I believe that we can do it with a much bigger impact because we have experienced so much, we have so much wisdom, and we have that opportunity to really go deeply and bring out into the world what we're really meant to. So those are some of the really potent, powerful opportunities that I believe we have as menopausal and postmenopausal women. That's fantastic. I I love it. I uh, I didn't I didn't have human children. I have cats, cats and mm -hmm. dogs, and uh, and and yet the I to me this notion of being creative and and allowing yourself the opportunity to dream. And and frankly, not I'm going to just say it, and not having a period every month, which is fabulous. Uh, that for me personally, it, it's amazing to not have that be a thing anymore. And, and yet, 
you know, we have this we have this opportunity, as you said, to think about the ideas that we didn't pursue before that now we can possibly pursue and to try things and to fail marvelously if we want to. You know, I tell my clients all the time, make marvelous mistakes. Go for it. Try, fail, get up, try again, fail, get up, try again. And eventually you'll find the exact place you're supposed to be, which I think is amazing. You went through all of these changes during your menopausal years and you started yet another company, right? You, you went, you're a naturopath, you're a belly dancer. And then to make things even a little bit more fun, you started Natural Look Mineral Makeup. I would love, first of all, I'm so glad it's vegan, which makes me very happy, but I would love to find out from you what made you decide this was a path you needed to take on top of all the other things you were doing. And tell me a little bit about what your mission is for the makeup and for the company, and especially as all of that relates to women in their menopausal years. Well, thank you for asking about that. And actually, this is a company that I have um, owned for 20 years. Ah, it okay. Was, it was one of the things that kind of got put on the back burner while I was raising my children. I see. Um, it came out of my, uh, my studies of herbal medicine, actually, in my early 20s. Um, it was kind of a roundabout way that this company was birthed. And uh, so I, I had a, a healing crisis in my early 20s. I found natural medicine. I studied herbalism with a very well-known herbalist in Portland, Oregon, by the name of Cascade Anderson Geller. And this was in the uh, mid-90s. And after I had studied for two years, I really wanted to do something with all of this new herbal knowledge that I had. But at that time in my life, I just wasn't sure that I was ready for the responsibility to help other people with their health. Mm. Um, and so in, um, in kind of pondering and, you know, being open to the universe to kind of guide me toward, you know, how can I use this in a way that um, makes a difference? I one day took a, a soap making class with a friend and we really loved the process of soap making and kind of, you know, bringing that, that old, you know, um, tradition, um, that traditional knowledge you know, back into our, our, our contemporary world. And we thought, you know what, you know, you're an herbalist, you know, I really like soap making, let's create uh, an herbal soap making uh, company. Hmm. And so I created this company, Herbs of Grace, which, which I now still own with, with a friend. And uh, so we made handcrafted herbal soaps and we sold them at the, the farmer's market in Vancouver, Washington. And after about a year, her life went a different direction. And so I, I took over the company and um, started doing uh, other body care products, herbal skin care products, facial care products. And I actually continued to sell at the farmer's market there for nine years and built up a pretty solid clientele. And uh, one day I realized in listening to them, that they were asking me for something more. I realized, I realized I kept hearing over and over again, you've got, you know, this beautiful line of herbal soaps, you've got the skin care, the body care, the facial care, we love it all. But, you know, one thing that we're really looking for is an all natural makeup line that's really healthy, you know, really pure and healthy. And at that time, there, there just weren't very many out there. Uh, so I took about a year of research and development and created this line of all natural mineral makeup. And I debuted it at the farmer's market the next year. And within six months, it became 90% of my sales. And so I just took that opportunity to streamline my product line and just focus on the mineral makeup. And interestingly, during that year of research and development, I what I really wanted to create was an herbal line of makeup. But what I found was that in order to make it shelf stable and you know um, you know make sure that it was a safe product for my customers, I would need to preserve it. And in researching 
natural preservatives, I just was not able to find one that I felt really confident in, um, in the safety and the, um, the naturalness and the effectiveness. And so what I found was that minerals are inert. Um, they're inorganic substances and they do not harbor fungi or bacteria. And so they will, they have an indefinite shelf life. Uh, they will last forever if kept properly. And uh, so that was, you know, just the sign that, okay, this is going to be uh, a completely mineral based line. And um, I'm really, one of the things that was really important to me was that this line be as healthy as I could make it and as pure with as few ingredients as possible. Um, you know, just the ingredients that were needed. I didn't want to add any fillers, any additives, uh, no preservatives, no artificial anything <laughs> in this line of makeup. And I really formulated it to be something that even people with the most sensitive of skins could use and could actually help to make the, their skin and their bodies healthier instead of, you know, what often happens with cosmetics is that, you know, we make concessions because, you know, we want our skin to look good. We want, um, you know, as, especially as we age, you know, we're, we're very aware of beauty and the, you know, the, the changes in our bodies. And so sometimes we'll make concessions like, okay, well, I know that this is maybe not the best thing, but, you know, I still want to use makeup or, or now that I'm older, I want to start using makeup. And I really just wanted a, a product line where people didn't have to make those concessions, where they had a really uh, wonderful, effective, beautiful uh, cosmetic that they could feel really good about using that, you know, that did the job of helping to, to beautify. And, you know, for me, it's, it's very artistic. I love makeup for the artistic quality, you know, to be able to be creative and beautify and accentuate your, your own natural beauty in a way that's also supporting your health. Yay. <laughs> I'm like, I, I keep wanting to just go mic drop. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because before I met you, before I knew who you were specifically, I, I own Herb of, Herbs of Grace products and love them. Mm -hmm. And what, what's interesting about this, and it, I don't want this to sound like an infomercial. That's not what this podcast is about. But <laughs> but what's interesting is that they're pretty versatile, right? So mm -hmm. So I would love it if you would chat just a little bit about what made you decide to make, because most of the time you see like, this can be an eyeshadow, this can be a, a blush, this can be a, a bronzer, but this is this is something that you can, like you said, it's creative in nature. You can decide how you're gonna work with this, this pro these products. Can you talk a little bit about the, the sort of the motivation for that for you? And also, what are some ways, what are some ways someone who's buying something like this could use it? Mm, yes, I absolutely love the versatility of loose powder mineral makeup. And, you know, there's a learning curve for people who, who have never used it before. But the thing that I love about it so much is the versatility. With loose powder mineral makeup, you can <clears throat> use it dry, you know, just as a, you know, with a, with a makeup brush and use it as a eye color or you know blush or lip color um, but you can also then um you know tap a little bit out into you know a small i often like to use like sushi sushi dishes um when i'm using my makeup and i tap a little bit out and i might tap a few different colors and create a whole new shade by blending some other colors together and wet my brush and then you know swirl it around in this sushi dish and <laughs> um <laughs> and um and apply it wet and then you get a different level of vibrance to the color um and i also love the fact that because i i i wanted to create this 
very uh, broad palette of natural shades that could be used for many different purposes. So instead of just having colors that are strictly eyeshadows or strictly blush or strictly lip colors, one shade could do all of those functions. And that's how I often do it is, you know, I pick a, a neutral shade like peach or apricot and I use it on my lips, I use it on my cheeks, I use it on my eyes. And so there's so much variety in the way you can use it. You can um, use the wet lining technique and use the same shade that you use for eyeshadow, but now use it as an eyeliner and or a brow color. And some of the shades that are a little bit more shimmery, you can use as a body shimmer and use it on your shoulders and your neckline um, or, or anywhere on your body. And so I just love the versatility of not only where you can use it on your body, but also the various techniques that you can use to put it on and then also blending and creating your own new shades with you know various different colors. And so the loose powder mineral format allows you to do all of those various things that you can't necessarily do with the conventional makeup. And I love the, the, the notion underneath everything you just said, Vanessa, is play. You get to play. You know, there's something so powerful about that for, for especially for women who are in, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond. We tend to go, oh, I, it's time for me to be, quote unquote, responsible. And I, I, I stand in the face of that. I kind of want to go, no, this is the time for us to play. This is the time for us to explore and create and dream and try. And, you know, playing with makeup. I used to have this thing that we called cowgirl night, of all things. And we used to we used to play fun you know, fun, raunchy games, but also my friends and I, we would break out the makeup trays and we would do, we would have these little makeover parties and just try and play. And to me, that kind of thing is really fun. If you've got a group of friends, all of whom want to play and you put, could put makeup on each other and it's, it sounds silly, but it's so much fun. And it is a wonderful way to develop new creative ways of seeing yourself and of working with some of the things that you might have thought you couldn't do anymore. And I'm here to tell you, you can. So bear that in mind. Um, and for, that was not you I was talking to, Vanessa. I'm talking to the listener now. If you're listening to this, <laughs> remember to play and playing with makeup is super fun. And you don't have to be a woman to do it. You can be a man, you can be gender fluid, whatever. Play, enjoy yourself. I think, you know, with makeup, with all of that stuff, I think we need more play in our lives anyway. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to step off my play soapbox now. So I, I, I want to thank you for, for taking the time to chat with me. And I have just a few more questions before we go off and do the, the little bonus episodes, a uh, uh, bonus episode of fun stuff. I do want to talk about something you mentioned right before we started recording this. I want to talk about the book you're writing because that the, the title, the working title already has me super intrigued. It's called Menomorphosis and I love the title. I love it. If I hope you keep it. Can you talk a little bit about what the book is and what prompted you to write it? Mm, thank you so much for asking about it. Yes, uh, the working title is Menomorphosis and the subtitle is spells, rituals, and herbal remedies for your menopausal journey. And so what prompted me to write the book was that I realized that although, you know, I love working with my clients one-on-one, -on -one, I also realized that there are a lot of women out there who are not going to work with me for a variety of reasons. It's just not right for them. Um, you know, they don't have the, the resources to work one-on-one, -on -one, you know, with a healthcare practitioner on this particular, you know, uh, area of their lives. Um, and there, there's only, you know, so many pe people that, uh, you know, I could work with, but if I was able to create a book that, really espoused, you know, the, the work that I do one on one, but in a in a wider, you know, more accessible format, then a lot more women could feel supported through this transition 
that I feel is so crucial and powerful for women. And so I just wanted a way to, to get the, these ideas of, you know, coming back to nature and supporting yourself and um, using this time of your life to uh, create more opportunities for yourself and really, you know, be able to reach those goals and those dreams, you know, to have those dreams, first of all, that maybe you've never allowed yourself to have, but then also to, to be able to birth those dreams into reality. So I, I just really felt like um, getting that out there in a book format would make it really accessible for a lot more people. And I, um, I was drawn to the title of Menomorphosis because number one, it, it speaks to the transformation of menopause, but it also kind of speaks to the, the metamorphosis of the butterfly for me. You know, a, a lot of times when you think of metamorphosis, metamorphosis, you think of the transformation a butterfly goes through, you know, um, from the stage of caterpillar and going through creating the cocoon and being in the cocoon and then basically dissolving your, you know, the body completely changing, but then, you know, breaking out and rebirthing as this beautiful, fabulous new creature, playful new creature. And I, I just want to say I 100% I support your um, words about being more playful. And so for me, the butterfly is a very uh, special symbol for me because um, the name Vanessa is Greek and it means butterfly. Oh, lovely. And so yes, I have a special connection with the butterfly. And so, and also then as well with that whole transformation process. So that's how I came about with the title of Menomorphosis. And I really just resonate with that being the symbol of this time of a, a woman's life and and the, the the butterfly being that symbol of what we can create what can we can rebirth and what we can be uh after we go through this transition as we're going through it we can kind of look to that that symbolism of what we are becoming as wise powerful women in our communities Yes, I love that notion. And, and and it's amazing to me what you just said. I just it sort of took me aback and I went, yeah, that's 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 a role that is so important for women to take, especially older women, to remember that we have so much power. We have so much sway and influence that often we forget to use you know <laughs> and so yes. so it's really important if you're if you're a woman who has gone through all of the life stages and gotten to the point where you're menopausal or postmenopausal you've gone through a lot so this notion of going yeah the, i'm powerful now we've got to remember that because we're not using our power as well as we could be uh and that's and that that is so important especially now uh i would like to ask you real quickly when's the book going to come out do you think i uh, have it set to come out at the end of the year so it should be launching uh sometime between the end of october and beginning of december yeah perfect for those holiday gifts just yeah. saying see i feel like i'm a, i'm an infomercial for you vanessa it's really you know and it's funny because how many i have i edit books what's well, one of the things that i do and i oh. it's funny how many of my uh book editing clients are women who are in this stage of life of being, you know, menopausal or postmenopausal and going, you know what, I've got a story in me or I've got a book in me or I want to talk about how to one of my clients recently was uh, she wanted it's it's called the book is called keeping your head above water and it's all about how stress relief and play can be powerful in mm. in in whatever age but especially for for women and professional women at that and so it's really interesting to me that so many women are going i have a story in me or i have guidance in me and now i want to share it and so you're joining you're joining a a, a long list of women who've who've stepped into their power in that way and i think that that's wonderful and amazing so congratulations in advance on oh, on you so getting much. your book out there yeah that's awesome uh and then i would love it if you wouldn't mind because i know people learn differently 
Uh, if you could share, I'm going to put it all in the show notes, all the social media and all of that contact stuff. But could you share via the audio how if someone goes, I need to know more about Herbs of Grace or I need to know more about Vanessa or butterflies or <laughs> herbalism or being, you know, natural path. Can you do me a favor and give those so that people, someone who's listening can go, oh, this is it and note it down? Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, my website is herbsofgracehealingarts.com. And, you know, from there I have all of my other links. But <clears throat> um, one of the, th the things that I just want to name is another great way to not only get in contact with me, but also, you know, be in community with me and other women who are also in this same or similar transition in their lives is um, to join my Facebook community. I have a thriving Facebook community called You Can Feel uh, Marvelous in Midlife Naturally. And, um, you know, that's a place where I regularly um, just, you know, have a lot of offerings and um, encourage all, all women to share their own wisdom, not just, you know, um, offering my wisdom, but I I really want it to be a place where women can support each other. And I often have lots of free events that I host. Um, I host guest speakers and herbal workshops. And um, I'm, a couple times a year, I might do um, an online retreat. And so um, I really encourage women who are wanting that kind of support and community to check that out. Awesome. And you know what? I'm realizing that I have the Facebook.com Herbs of Grace Natural Look Mineral Makeup page, but I don't have the other page on the for the show notes. So I'm going to need that link from you so that I can put that okay. in there, too. Uh, right. Just I'm just saying that <laughs> <laughs> because, as, as I said, I don't edit, but I thought I should say that or we would be sitting here going, I don't know what that link is. Uh, OK. And then I have before we click off for this episode and do the bonus episode. I have just one last question for you, Vanessa. And it's a silly question, but I find that it can yield some profound answers. And the question is this. If you had an airplane, environmentally friendly, of course, that could <laughs> skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Mm, wow. Let's see, what would I say? I think I would say something to the effect that that you are powerful and you have inner wisdom. That works for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah, and it would fit nicely across the sky. You are powerful and you have inner wisdom. <laughs> Vanessa, thank you so much for joining me for this. What a phenomenal conversation. I'm super grateful that you took the time. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. It's been delightful. Of what what a fun and it's funny because it's I'm just I, you know I'm like wait a minute I own herbs of grace products <laughs> that so, is so funny. I'm like a, I'm like a spokesperson without meaning to be a spokesperson I didn't you know I, I was a spokesperson before I knew it uh, the, which is which is super cool and and yes testimonial they are great products there you go uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much my pleasure uh, Vanessa Nixon thank you so much for being on the show this is Isolde Trachtenberg reminding you that if you're listening to this, you are listening to the Innovative Mindset Podcast and it's going to be going through a change. By now, it may already have gone through a change. I'm changing the name at some point in the next little while. So bear that in mind. But always remember that what I say to you at the end never changes. And that is that I remind you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. <music> Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2022. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. 
Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you.